and welcome to Thomson Reuters' inaugural anti-slavery summit. Thomson Reuters wants to be a catalyst for change. It's great that we have managed today to bring together business, bankers, lawyers, corporates, and our NGO partners to really try to tackle modern day slavery. It is 2017 and today we have more slaves in the world than at any time in history. Two thirds of those slaves are in Asia. So we sit here really in the front line. We need an all hands on deck approach to tackle modern day slavery. It's my honor to be patron of this important gathering. According to the Global Slavery Index compiled in 2016, by the Walk Free Foundation. Some 46 million persons around the world live and work in conditions of enslavement. Persons who have no choice as to where they work, to whom they work, or how long. Persons almost always living in squalid conditions and facing constant intimidation, threats to their health, and in some cases, even death. I've been documenting humanity around the world for some 30 years in a hundred and something countries on six continents. And what I knew I could do was photograph somebody and no matter how dire or dark the situation, I knew that I could photograph their dignity. Um, this particular woman, after I had returned home, I think it was two months after I was home, I got an email from my contact there who let me know that her body was found outside of the brothel in the gutter. And what was really sad about it, despite the obvious, is that it was never looked into. No, no investigation was ever made. And she was forgotten, but not by me and hopefully not by all of you here. Is this a matter of criminal organizations or is this a matter of business and business as usual? And I want to take that even one step farther, because as business as usual often sounds an awful lot like cultural acceptance, which sounds a lot like boys will be boys, which sounds a lot like not saying something when your friends want to go to a strip club. Every four seconds we have another person entering slavery. I do it. One, two, three, four, another slave. And the drum beats on and on and on. Domestic workers in Hong Kong is a very clear issue. Um, we've heard about it in the news. Um, we've heard our friends say things that are sometimes shocking and offensive to us at times. Um, and, and when we looked at this problem, um, we dug down into it and looked at, there's a all kinds of laws that could be changed. Um, but what really makes it slavery and what makes it a debt bondage situation is that these workers are paying for their jobs. I want to go back to this number. It's 150 billion. This is what we focus on. It's the third largest crime in the world. In fact, I argue that this number is far too low and it probably is the second largest crime. But people tend to forget about that this is a crime. At the same time, I defy the definition that this is all organized crime. I actually believe that this is business. This is about money. We're not going to prosecute our way out of this problem. Neither are we going to rescue and rehabilitate our way out of this problem. Y you've seen the numbers. Um, we've all got a part to play in prevention, which means we're going to have to take more risks. The toolkit uh, has had a phenomenal response. It's uh, a list of indicators of suspicious activity, uh, spanning transactional data, know your client, and physical behavioral in-branch indicators. Um, and it, it also gives guidance to banks on how you can practically go about operationalizing some of these indicators uh, in your institution. The challenge for us now though is to try and create collectives so that um, we all can buy in and in a similar way that you benefit certain suppliers because they are good, what we need to do as an industry is, is give them the economies of scale that actually allows them to compete with those who use cheap labour. Because at the end of the day, as we've heard, this is business. 
those of us who want to do the right thing actually need to do it together mm -hmm. because it becomes a force multiplier. Um, and that's something from, that I personally take away from today. If we all manage to come around the same table, come up with one united global estimate on the number of victims out there, then perhaps we can use it as a baseline. If you gather together as a sector, that means there is no first mover disadvantage. These are all business processes. Uh, the piece that I also want to speak about is what I would call the victim process. What are we doing for the workers? Because at the end of it, our program uh, and the work is really around worker rights. In many countries, there are 25 lawyers in total that are able to represent victims of human trafficking. I mean, that's nothing. The asymmetry of resources between corporates on the one hand and individual victims is is so stark, it's frightening. I would say as a firm as well, I mean, we of course are ourselves covered by the Act and have made our own statements in respect of compliance with the Modern Slavery Act and have done more engagement as a result of this, this legislation than we have ever done before in a more, I think, rigorous way, turning, turning the mirror on ourselves and saying it, it's not good enough for us to be advocates for this issue without also knowing that our own house um, is in order. 1.1 billion people, billion, have no legal digital identity. And it's problematic. These are the people that are most vulnerable because when you don't have a piece of paper, suddenly you can be easily subjected to trafficking, to smuggling, to being put into conditions where you can't stand up and represent yourself. Our goal is to significantly reduce the amount of time it takes to get to a victim's identity and to their location. So in the first three days that we deployed Face Search, it identified two missing kids sold online. And just last week I spoke with law enforcement from Los Angeles who told me that they used it to find a 16-year-old runaway just by uploading her photo and finding a 93% match. We decided we'd try and look at supply chains from the point of the object. What if we could take a diamond and uniquely identify it? What if we could track it from the source of the mine to the market and bring accountability to that supply chain across the globe? So where does that bring us? Once it's about prevention, it becomes a whole new ballgame as far as civil society is concerned. It becomes a concept of sustainability, but we don't necessarily, until recently, talk about social sustainability. But the idea that agriculture is not sustainable if the hands that pick the crops or the hands that pull the nets are enslaved. Look at this not as a close but as a beginning of what all we can do to fight against human trafficking, what all we can do to put the civil back in our civilization.